everybody, and welcome to Attendance Bias. I am your host, Brian Weinstein, and boy, do I have a heck of a show for you today. Before we get into it, I just have a few things to note before we get started. First, this is absolutely true. I was so excited to talk to today's guests that I literally forgot to plug in my microphone before I hit record. So as a result, the computer mic picked up my voice, and it doesn't sound as clear as it normally does for this recording. I couldn't believe it once I noticed, but after about two minutes of listening back to the recording, I barely noticed anymore, so I hope that you have the same experience. I'm sorry about that. Second, today's episode features a lot, and I really mean a lot, of references to name checks of locations around Long Island. There are two guests today, and all three of us are from the area. In addition, the focus of today's episode is a store that was on Long Island, along with a show from the Nassau Coliseum. So if you grew up on or near Long Island, especially in the 80s or 90s, today's conversation will probably stir up tons of memories and put a smile on your face. If you're not from Long Island, you can either break out a map to follow along, or you could just nod along as the references come out fast and hard. All that said, today's episode completes a full circle for me, and it answered questions that I've been wondering about literally for decades— This podcast is a passion project of mine, and speaking to today's guests is something I've wanted to do for a long time and never thought I would be able to. As personal as it is to me, though, I suspect that it will be really meaningful to fans who had a similar upbringing to mine, and especially fans from the Northeast, or at least from the tri-state area. Today's guests are Don Cantor and Cara Polizzi, the owner and manager, respectively, of Prime Cuts. Prime Cuts was, or is, a no longer operational head shop that was primarily located in Rockville Center and then Belmore, both towns on Long Island. You'll hear me say this in just a few minutes, but soon after I discovered Fish, I discovered Fish Tapes. For a young teenager who didn't have full-time access to the internet, remember it wasn't everywhere all the time back then, and I also didn't know other fans, that all made it pretty difficult to get any unofficial recordings of Fish. But eventually, through a friend's sister, I discovered Prime Cuts, and Prime Cuts is where I discovered the world of Fish tapes, as well as tapes from many other men's. I might have never heard of Mo if not for this store. And you'll hear more about it, I don't want to spoil it, but Prime Cuts was more than a store. It was a discovery, it was a connection to a wider world, it was a community center in some ways, and it was an oasis for those who were into the scene, but didn't know how to find like-minded fans. In today's conversation with Don and Caro, we all go deep into the origins of the store, the nuts and bolts of how the taping process worked, and answer the long-debated question of whether or not Prime Cuts' taping allowance was sanctioned by Fish. For the attendance bias segment of the episode, Don chose to discuss the second set of April 3rd, 1998 at the Nassau Coliseum, and Kara chose to talk about Fluffhead and You Enjoy Myself from Fish's 3.0 comeback show on March 6, 2009 at Hampton. Both picks are epic highlights of the band's career, and I was thrilled about how much crossover there was with our conversation today and attendance bias stories from past guests. But enough from me. I hope you can feel the love and the joy and enthusiasm in today's conversation with Don and Kara of Prime Cuts Music Emporium. Let's meet today's guest. Don and Kara of Prime Cuts and of New York as well. Thank you both so much for joining me today on Attendance Bias. It's lovely to have you. Thank you. Thank you. So glad to be here. I want everyone to know that Kara and I are in separate places, COVID and everything else aside, but Kara and I have hardly, we've hardly spoken to each other for a long time. And if we step on each other, it's because of that. <laughs> we'll try to get all the answers to everybody as best we can. For anyone who is listening who doesn't know, this is a very personal interview of mine. I grew up on the South Shore of Long Island in a town called Merrick. And just a few towns over in Rockville Center, there was a head shop that was a bit more special than other head shops that I've been to. And when I say a bit, I mean a hell of a lot. And so when I started Attendance Bias, I made a list of dream guests. And on that list of dream guests was Don from Prime Cuts. 
And <laughs> over the magic of the internet, uh, through Facebook, as a matter of fact, Kara got in touch with me after I posted something about Prime Cuts. And the two of us went back and forth for a bit. And she eventually put me in touch with Don. And I thought it would only be appropriate for the three of us to have a chat about the, the head shop, fish in general, and about our favorite jams. So that's my spiel. That's my introduction. Let's start with the easiest way to get to know each other with the attendance bias lightning round. Attendance bias lightning round. So first, Kara, we'll start with you. You ready? I'm ready. All right, Kara, what was your first fish show? My first fish show was May 1993. My college boyfriend had taken me. He was from Nashville, New Hampshire. We were at UNH. And it was in like a, a shed kind of situation, but it was definitely fun. I had been introduced to fish just, that was May the October before. Was so, that, was May 8th? Does that sound about right? It's either the 8th or the 3rd, so probably, yeah. Yeah, I remember I had that tape probably from your shop. And I think they played Jessica by the Allman Brothers. They did, 100% the they did. Of either Possum or Bowie, so that's yeah, a helpful Bowie. show. Oh, right. That's yeah. a good first show. Don, what was your first one? <laughs> Coincidentally, my first show was at the Marquee in New York City on uh, December 28th, 1990. So, That's um, funny. It, it is. I was freaking out as I was listening to your last episode. I said, wow, now it's just going to sound like I'm, <laughs> I'm <laughs> the, uh, uh, Sue on that. But uh, yeah, I met Sue at that show. Oh, really? It's just that my recollection was in the first set. I was, I went down, I'm trying to think if I went with one of my employees, Marty, I think went down with me, but we were, we were just hanging out and I was speaking to someone who said they were working for a record label. Now, Sue said on your interview that there was nobody else from any record label around and it, it was a woman and it must have been her. And we were talking about, oh my God, these guys are amazing because I had heard some of their music and I went down to check to check out the band and I was blown away. And so there it is. I guess it affected both Sue and myself the same way. Carol, what was your most recent Fish show? My last show was um, 12-1-19 that the barn, Nassau's Coliseum. It was pretty good. It was a good time. I was there too. Yeah, I think they're kind yeah. of not growing the Coliseum a bit. I, I'm, I, I'm a Long Island, it, but I'm not a huge fan of Nassau, to be honest. Exactly. <laughs> it's just not the greatest venue, but it was local. Yep. And yep. you can't say no to local fish. Agreed. Don, what was your most recent show? <laughs> well, after doing so many shows every year <laughs> for 20 years, after uh, Coventry, Vermont in 2004, the band hung them up supposedly. And <laughs> so had I, uh, I went to Watkins uh, Glen because I lived literally, I still live a half hour away from Watkins, uh, 2011, I guess that was. And I believe actually that was their second show at Watkins. Uh, was that, was that the first? And, and then they were there in 2014, I guess. So I actually vended at those two shows in the, in the lot as an official vendor of fish. What's the name of your business? Indigo Moon, named after my youngest child. And what do you sell? Much of what Prime Cuts used to sell, only updated, newer styles, clothing, thousands of stickers. I still have my jam band stickers, as well as I went a little bit too far into politics, <laughs> but funny stuff also, uh, funny stickers. And, and uh, yeah, I've had that business going ever since uh, Prime Cuts ended. We, we kept it going, I should say. Kara, all things being equal, what's your favorite venue to see fish? My dream venue would be Red Rocks. My favorite place, Jones Beach. Oh, but you know what? I do want to add. Yeah. Keyspan Park was amazing. I wish they would come back there, you know? And Jay-Z with Jay-Z. You know what? I had so much fun at that show. I had Me so too. much fun. <laughs> Me too. I had just gotten married. I was home from my honeymoon for one day. And I went to that. It was, it was like the greatest thing ever. Don, you I, look, I, you're bursting with something to say. I, I often am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was about to say Coney Island. 
And now where Keystone Park is? Coney Island. Yeah. It is the Coney Okay. I, I never think of it as Keystone. Yeah, I was there for those shows with Jay-Z or for the show with Jay-Z. And that was fantastic. Just being on the water. But right there, I, oh, we had a, a fish dinner that couldn't be beat <laughs> um, right before we went to the show, too. And, oh, yeah, I was vending in the lot right next to <laughs> next to the stadium. Of course you were. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of that. Kara, if you had to pick overall indoor fish or outdoor fish? Outdoor. Hands down. 100% outdoor. Yeah. But if you have to go indoor, it has to be MSG. I would agree with that. I'd sign on to that. Uh, yeah. Kara, are you chasing any songs? Have any songs gotten away from you that you still haven't heard after years um, of seeing them? But chasing, Adley, you sexy thing. Oh, Hot it's chocolate. so fun, yeah. <laughs> and chasing me, uh, Mona Dance. Uh, are you I'm okay it all the it. time? First set, like, come on, guys, let's get moving. A little something <laughs> speedier. So, but yeah, those ch- chasing and chase. Don, how about you? A song that you still haven't seen or that you'd love to see and any songs that you can't get away from? Well, way back when I I had missed out a couple times on Game Hen sh- shows and that's one that I, I'll never catch up to, but uh, that's okay. As far as shows that have chased uh, or songs that have chased me, I can't say I can... I can think of the yes, You go to every show. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> All right. Next up, favorite post-show snack. You get home or you're on your way home and you can have anything after the encore. What are you going for? Kara, how about you? Falafel. Don, how about you? What what are you uh, craving after a show? Well, it depends what I've been doing at the show, but uh, it would be <laughs> a, a chocolate thick malt and french fries. Nice. Let's let's stop it all American then. Get off the train of massive people. Yeah. And (laughs) finally, this these answers might take a little while. Kara, Mm. what is the weirdest thing you've ever seen at a fish show? And the word weird means whatever you want it to. (laughs) The weirdest thing I've ever seen at a fish show is something I actually did. Um, it was New Year's Eve, 94. We were pre-gaming in my apartment in Boston. Long story short, I had made someone a little bit angry because for whatever reason, and it was New Year's and we were, again, all indulging. And I got a phone call threatening to have my cat boiled and skinned. And I'm on my way out to see fish. Well, because I am completely inebriated, I put cotton balls in his ears. I put him in a backpack and I brought him to the Boston Garden. Your cat. My cat, Casey Jones, who I got when I was into the dead (laughs) and before I got to fish. Yep. And the poor cat, I hugged my back. I put my backpack in the front and I was holding him and he was right. Casey was a hippie. Did your cat have a good time? Did he? (laughs) He seemed to have. All right, good. Maybe he got a contact eye. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe he ate that sugar (laughs) cube. Uh, Don, oh, goodness. Don, what's the weirdest thing you've ever seen out of fish show? First of all, Kara's story wins hands down. <laughs> I, was, I was just going to say when I was at one of my <laughs> first shows, oh, well, in 92, 93, where I first saw the first all fall down and I had no idea what the hell was happening. And <laughs> my friends were laughing at me and I had to catch up. And that was part of what really drew me into fish. Um, Way back in the day, uh, it was my friends and I who, this is going off on a tangent, we had been the originators of the whole Rocky Horror Movement and all (laughs) audience participation. I I totally remember that. (laughs) I was voted the best Dr. Scott in New York City in 1978. I mean, I was really into it. We, We were the first ones to throw rice and toast. The whole idea of audience participation was wonderful to me. And after seeing the dead for many, many years, which it still holds a incredibly special place in my heart, but fish was this breath of fresh air and nothing before or since has duplicated that. Let's talk about the history 
of Please. Prime Cuts, uh, the head shop, the reason we're all here. Like I said, for anyone at home, Prime Cuts was a head shop. Um, and a lot of Long Islanders I've spoken to on this show and otherwise, I'm thinking of Slade Somer, who uh, we went over the February 28th, 2003 show at the Nassau Coliseum together, many others. Whenever I learned that someone grew up on Long Island and got into fish of a certain age, I'll say, Prime Cuts just strikes to the heart. You should see their faces when I say those two words. Their mouths drop and then turns immediately into a smile. I just wanted to um, interject and clarify. We were, never, we were not the typical head shop in that we never sold paraphernalia. So our draw and the success of the, sh- of the store was never based on a bunch of people who needed something of that nature. They right. came for the music. Yeah, they came for everything that Don created. Yeah, well, that was going to lead into my next question. I just want to tell my perspective of Prime Cuts, and then Don, you could take the lead since you were the owner. And is it fair to say the founder of Prime Cuts? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. So Thanks. my from my perspective, I got into fish when I was 14 years old. And so this was around 1996. And I listened to a picture of Nectar, and that sold me for life. And I wanted to find as much fish as I possibly could. And the internet was just past its infancy, I would say. It's, it, it was there, but I wasn't savvy enough. I was just getting out of middle school, basically. And I didn't know about blanks and postage. I didn't know about rec music fish. I, it was just what I could find in Sam Goody. And as any fish fan will tell you, that's not enough. And my friend Craig, his sister had a tape. <laughs> And I don't remember which tape. I think it was December 1st, 1995 at Hershey. And she dubbed it for us. And I, we asked her, where did you get this tape? It was purple on the J card. It had the most beautiful, fun, scribbly writing on the <laughs> side. And she told us Prime Cuts in Rockville Center. So once we found out where it was, my friend Craig, whose name might come up a lot, by the way, uh, and my friend Daniel, Danny, the three of us would walk to the Merrick train station, the Long Island Railroad station. We would get on the train. We'd try to hide so the conductor wouldn't see us. We wouldn't have to pay for a ticket because we were only going three stops. Absolutely. You you know? know that. And then we'd get off at Rockville Center and it was like a half mile or less north on Long Beach Road. We'd get a slice of a grandma slice at Gino's. At Gino's. Gino's. Yeah. And then we'd go I miss in. Gino's. Yeah, it's still there. <laughs> And but I'm not. <laughs> I know. And we would go in the back. And to me, the 15-year-old new fish fan, this is what made fish special. In the back, there was a table with a series of binders over it. And you know what, Don? Wow. I'll, let you, I'll let you take Can it. Can I from interject there. for a minute? Or Carrie, you take it from there. Those tables were originally in the front of the shop. So yes. it had already progressed to when we moved them into the back and the whole store was rearranged. Yeah, that was our second store for that matter. Yeah, uh, yeah. Don, you know what? You tell the story. Can you start off? Because I'm I'm waxing poetic and I'll go on forever if you let me. Well, of course. And first of all, yeah, Kara, you brought up some good things. First of all, yeah, when I started Prime Cuts, it was originally in Little Neck, Queens. And I started as a used record store. I was able to open my first store. This is 1983 on $8,000 and a couple of really large used record purchases that included all original Hendrix on the original labels, all the original Kinks, all the original Yardbirds. This guy was parting with the mother of all collections. It was over 3,000 albums of all pristine stuff. And I said, okay, I can open up my store now. It was several years in of selling used records, classic rock, um, alternative rock, punk now i always had a love for the dead but back in 83 84 the dead was i it was it, they were their lean years there was not much going on there uh jerry sounded awful and i had veered away from uh. it i never considered myself a deadhead and this would come up all the time that people would say oh you must be such a deadhead uh later on of course and i'd say no actually i i, I don't want to give myself that credit I love all sorts of music. Back in 86, The Dead had come out with their In the Dark album, 86, 87. 
And all of a sudden there was this whole resurrection of, uh, we call them the in the dark deadheads. And the scene came alive again. And I had been going down to dead shows since about 81. I started going again after not having gone for seven or eight years. And it was the lot scene, which was just unparalleled. The show was, I mean, there are many shows where I'd get there five, six hours ahead of time. We'd go through the lot. They were everyone from uh, people giving away food. There were shirts, there were stickers. That, you, you know, the scene, it's the lot scene. And I remember so many shows where I'd end up saying, oh my goodness, I forgot. We still have the show to go to. And it was like icing on the cake. <laughs> I swear there are times when, well, there were times the very, just as a note, the very last Grateful Dead show um, with, of all time with Jerry Garcia uh, down in Washington, D.C. I sold my tickets in a lot because I was having such a good time with all my friends out there. So what pushed you toward the store? OK, so I had the store going already and I said, OK, as as my tastes were evolving, I had started listening and looking for okay the, you know the dead were great but they're at that point in a an artist's career where not much new was happening to me it was a miracle that in the dark came out as such fresh new stuff but i started <clears throat> seeing that there was so much on dead tour that once it was gone once you were off the tour you could never see it again all those homemade shirts all the clothing we had girls who made their own clothing and some guys too, actually. Uh, and we're, we're hawking it out in the shows. And I said, Oh, I, I could do this better than anyone. I already know all, uh, you know all the people in the lot. And I started just handing out my card and saying, Hey, if you have anything left over after tour, I, I'm not competing with you. I'm not competing with you in the lot, but come see me. And I started bringing this stuff in little by little into prime cuts. And by then I had opened up in 1980 end of 86, beginning of 87, I opened up the Rockville Center, the first Prime Cuts um, store. It was about a thousand square feet. And we started putting in the clothing, the stickers. And I knew people, I knew a lot of people in the dead taper section. And we started putting in tapes. Now I, there's a caveat in there. I wanted to make it your home away from tour because back then without the internet, it was like a lot. If you missed the shows, you missed them. That was it. Uh, if you were able to find a guy to trade with in the back of Relics magazine, great. But otherwise, you you were SOL. And that was the original inspiration for it. And then when I started hearing about spin doctors, we learned about fish through them. We said, oh, my goodness, the jam scene just got larger. It's not just the Almond Brothers and Little Feet and the Radiators we got young blood coming in here. And to me, that mm -hmm. was always the fresh, new, vital, the vibrancy that went along with it. That was, un, you, you, you could not mistake it. You, you could not miss it. And I remember just <laughs> thinking, okay, I, I can call up the management of each of these independent uh, bands who didn't have label signings and say to them, hey, would you sell me your merchandise? I'll bring it into my store. And uh, Fish was more than happy. Dry Goods was more than happy to do it. A little later, Mo came, uh, came along and John Topper, their manager, spoke to him. And he was he invited me out to his home in, in Jersey. We sat down for a nice spaghetti dinner, I remember. <laughs> and we went over it and he said, yeah, any show you want to go to, Don, you're golden. And I just had that epiphany. It's like, oh my goodness, I looked around. Nobody was doing this in New York City. I'm saying, okay, we got 10, 12 million people, whatever, you know, including the surrounding area. And nobody has had this idea. And you know what? It's not like I can compete with Tower Records or Virgin Megastore or whatever else was around at the time, Sam Goodies. And I said, but nobody can compete with me on this because I know the scene. I've been part of this scene. And they can't, you can't duplicate that. You can't find guys selling their own bootleg shirts and stickers just anywhere. It wasn't on the internet. There was no internet. So and your, was, your, your merchandise was sourced from people from the lot and oh, did it work I, like you would, they would get a cut of, or you would get a cut of it and then they would get part of it. How did that work? The ins and outs? No, they, it, I wanted to make it simple. I didn't want people to have to worry about anything. I would just say, 
sell me. I'll buy. I guarantee you, I will buy all the shirts you have after the tour ends. I will buy all the stickers. And if you ran out of them, but you want to make some more up, I'll take 100. I'll take 200. At one point, we had well over 400 different lot shirts between Fish and the Dead. And they, we had them hung up. If you remember in the store, they were they were all hung up with clothesline. Clothesline. Yeah. It was old school. It was janky, but boy, <laughs> to, me, to me, it was home. And I think a lot of people felt that way too. They were hanging right above your head. And the yeah. and the, uh, the the poster boards with the stickers, and they were, it was constantly evolving because we'd run out of this one, and then we'd get this one, and overlapping mm-hmm. numbers and. But the sticker board was just crazy. <laughs> the, the sticker board? You mean the 25 sticker board? Said, well, I should say the sticker wall. It grew. It, it became a monster. It um, was a life of its own. Yeah, it truly was, and, Kara. And to go in and find it in the box, it was like, wish me luck down here. <laughs> yeah, I'm going in. Cover me. That's right. And somehow we, more times than not, we would find it or someone would say, you know what, forget about that. Let me have this one instead. Matter of fact, let me have these five. And that was the thing. The music always came first, first and foremost. But it's, I did not want to make money off of the the live music. It wasn't my place to make money off of the live music. I thought about it long and hard. Brian, yeah, this is where it comes in where the, the meat and potatoes of Prime Cuts was. Um, I had a pretty good merchandising background, uh, just mostly (laughs) self-taught. And I realized the whole concept of loss leaders, of getting something that you made no money on, but it would bring people to the store and bring them in again and again and again. And once they were there, they'd have other things to look at. And you don't go home with just your 10 tapes from the last tour. You go home with 10 tapes, three shirts, a sweatshirt, a couple homemade dresses, and who knows what else. Yeah, you're looking at me. You, I am the loss leader. Like you are describing my entire high school experience right so, now. I mean, you, I would keep coming back every time I had a babysitting job and I made twenty bucks or twenty five bucks. The next uh-huh. day, I checked the train schedule. That's so funny. Was the income. Yeah, I remember every single year, the day before Christmas. Every straight laced parent on earth would walk into that store. <laughs> oh, funny. We would have a line out the door. What should I buy my child? They like this. They <laughs> like the Grateful Dead. And but these parents were and like family members who had no clue except like they had heard about this band. And we we're like pick gift shopping for people, and the line would be crazy. Well, you have it to was, imagine yeah. as a parent, you know, if you went to, if you were straight, like you said, straight laced, you go to Tower Records or Sam Goody at Roosevelt Field Mall, how much fish are you going to find? Like negative five, you know, virtually right, nothing. Right. And this is the place to go. This is the place that people talk about. I remember I had your business card in my wallet with the little sun with the sunglasses on it. It was like red <laughs> and, and the red sun, I think it was or like maroon ish. And yes. You know, this was out of here somewhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, with this, right. it's in the big box of stickers. You'll find it there. But, mm-hmm. but, but that makes sense because it was, it was an oasis for people who were into this music that couldn't find it elsewhere. And I just want to say from a consumer's point of view, the way it worked is I would walk in and I'd go to the back, I guess, after you rearrange the store, I wasn't hip you know, before that. And you had these binders full of set lists and next to the binders of set lists, it was almost like a library where you'd have these little uh, trays with ripped up pieces of index cards and with golf pencils right next to them. And (laughs) as a consumer, if I saw a set list or a show that I wanted, you take it, you take the little slip of paper and the golf pencil and you'd write down the band, the, uh, the date and the set. And I'd bring it to the front Whoever was working the front would go disappear into the back. All right, I'd give it to Kara. She disappeared. The magic, the magic cave in the back. I have to tell you, this has lived in my mind's eye for decades. And so she'd go into the back, collect these tapes, bring them up. And if I'll please correct me, I believe it was about four dollars a tape, which I was told covered 
the tape, yes. the cost of the blank, a little less, the cost of the blank, and like a dollar of for man hours of of uh, to copy the tape. Three fifty. Okay, of Maxell two S tape. Maxell two S's. Yes. Right. Oh. You could even want bring your own, Don. Was that that's right? Liberal, if, you know that. If you brought a seal, stuff. that's right, Kara. Mom was it if you brought what, Kara? If you brought in your own sealed tapes, like say you bought them at Costco or whatever, Don would still take them in and you know do his thing and charge the this a dollar. Charge one dollar yeah. for the taper fee. That was it, just to cover my employees the the cost of hiring two guys who ran full time in the back. I mean, some days it was literally 20 hours a day. Um, they were, I went through so many tapers because they were burned out. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, I believe but yeah, it. That, that was the thing. That was the thing. I did not want to make money off of that. So the tapers got their dollar. If I had any left over, I calculated it out. And there was a one foundation called 1% for peace. There was a, uh, Oh geez, <laughs> uh, the wagon, um, wagon wagon wheel. Yep, yeah. and I would go up to. I remember Russ, who uh, was uh, a good friend of the store. He worked for the Wagon Wheel Foundation, and I'd go up to him at the shows, and I'd write out a five hundred dollar check and give it to him because that was left over from money that came from the tapes between 90, 1990. Three and 99, we hardly ever had a slow day. It was madness in there, but it was fun madness. You got to see your family every day, your extended family. And let me tell you, Brian, and you know it too. Well, you were 15 when you started coming, you said? Maybe 14, but, yeah. No, oh gosh. <laughs> um, but well, the every, every day I woke up, I was blessed because I jumped out of bed and could not wait to get my day started. I'd run down to either a record distributor first, or I'd run into the city to a uh, crazy Eddie for a while. Was oh, my, of course, my crazy Eddie. Tape. His prices were insane. <laughs> was, <laughs> that was, I, I'd be going in there um, two, three times a week at six or seven um, in the morning. Sometimes they'd let me in before they opened. And I, they would be ready with a pallet of tapes. I'd buy 500 to 1,000 at a time. I mean, it was, it was crazy. I had said, and we got in our, when the early days of the internet and fish forums, they started coming out, but this is years later, but uh, some bad press about prime cuts and people were making up their own stories and lies. When you post or when um, memories of prime cuts occasionally pop up online, there's mm-hmm. like always the this mythology or these rumors, like you said, people make up their own stories that Fish Inc. would be upset with you. Is there any oh. truth to that or is that all BS? Because they never knew I existed. Huh? I was their largest, Prime Cuts, not me, Prime Cuts was their largest retail outlet. And that includes Burlington, that includes anywhere. And they told me this themselves. I spoke regularly to Amy Skelton, met her back in, if it wasn't 91, it was 92 she had told me, yeah, you are hands down the biggest purchaser of our merchandise. You got us going. You you are helping us so much. And Amy had given me the explicit permission to go. I explained the tape situation and Amy said, you go for it, but you got to do me a favor. You got to keep it low key because technically I can't go telling other people or if other stores ask, I can't say, oh yeah, only they have my permission. But she said, I will not bust you. I will, I understand what you're doing. She said, there were times when she'd call and she'd say, can't you keep it lower key? And I said, Amy, I don't advertise it. I don't talk about it. It's not in my, you know, in my advertisements uh, on radio. We, uh, we hosted the, uh, the Deadhead Hour for a long time in New York City. Never mentioned the tapes. Didn't have to. The word of mouth was everything. And people couldn't believe it. And other people would argue for me. They'd say, wait a second. How can Fish not know about Prime Cuts? And they also mentioned, rightfully, he has every um, official Fish shirt and sticker in the store as well. Surely they would cut him off because they they cut off other stores for doing uh, similar things. But people weren't looking for the logic there. They were they were looking for like what's the angle and how how are we going to get this guy? And I I, I guess this is just how. People look at life. Um, maybe New Yorkers are more cynical than others. Yeah. Um, but I was 
very much, I was a fish head first and I wanted to support this band and nurture them and the jam scene in general. Well, Carol, I wanted to ask you, how did you get involved? Like, where, where yeah. do you fit into this story? It's just, I want to backtrack one and then I'm going to throw this in. Yeah. Don, Don, I think we should give creed to how well some of my coworkers and your employees have evolved into the Grateful Dead and or Fifth Scene. And I think you Matt know who I'm ret- referring to. Yes, <laughs> thank you. A cheers for Matt Bush. Tell the story, Don. <laughs> well, Matt, I, I don't know if I have the same story either, but Matt Bush was a young kid coming in. He had been pre-law up in uh, SUNY Albany. Yeah. And he was just starting to get into the scene. And he said, yeah, like, um, he, <laughs> no offense, Matt, if you ever listen to this, but he was a little <laughs> bit geeky, but he was a really good guy. And yeah, you're nodding your head. <laughs> I, th- I think we're all a little bit geeky, but good guys and girls. I think if you're into fish, Matt by was- definition, part of you is kind of geeky. Matt, smart guy, really smart guy. He ended up working with me. He was one of the best and most loyal employees. I think Matt stayed around for five or six years, which when you're talking about little part-time jobs, that's pretty darn good. I, I knew I'm, I must be doing something six right. Six years. On to my employees. <laughs> six Was years. Six, six years. Yeah, Kara. Well, Kara, <laughs> how did you get involved in the first place? Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll fi- let's finish with where Matt Bush ended up. Matt, but, well, Alvin. last I, I knew, he had become the tour manager for the Dead and for the Allman Brothers at one time. Where did he end up past that? He is currently working for and living with Bob Weir as his personal assistant. Oh, wow. Oh, geez. Does he have oh, wow. cuts From crime <laughs> cuts to Bob <laughs> Weir's house, this kid. Okay, so how I got involved with crime cuts. Right. I was out with my mom shopping. And Don, I don't know if you remember, my mom was quite the personality. Uh Uh-huh, I do. And uh, I was looking at some hippie dresses or whatever. And Don came over and, you know, we were talking or whatever. And, uh, you know, I I just randomly said, are you guys looking for help? I knew I I had you on the spot, yeah. No, 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 no. Then you're like, well, why don't you come in and talk to me? And I brought in my, my, like, agenda of when I was, and you go, no one has ever brought notes to an interview before. <laughs> she goes, go ahead. <laughs> and also, um, my mother was in the record industry. So I think he uh, totally mm-hmm. saw some music. But I think my mom and Don got off on a talk about just like the record industry in itself. And the prime cuts became part of my life. And so, Kara, what were your like day to day responsibilities like? And what what would a day in prime cuts look like for you? It was always fun. We would get there, we would stock the tapes for the day. Basically, I, I ran the register. I was constantly trying to organize stickers or patches or Good you know, right. and the t shirts <laughs> and which bin is what and. This and that. It was also a lot of, you know, just informing the customers, like, and kind of guiding them, like, oh, well, if you like this show, you might want to check out that show. Oh, to add on to that, yeah, I was, I was very customer centric. I had the rules to go by that when somebody came in the store, I wanted to treat them like family. And I always told people, all my employees, give them 30 seconds just to get their feet wet in the store and then go over and say, I'm right over here. If you need help, just come ask and I'll be with you. And Carol was one of the really good customer service people that I had. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what would you say was the best selling items in the store other than the tapes? More tapes. <laughs> okay. Incense? I don't know. Oh my T-shirts. gosh. Glenn 22. The yes. incense. We stunk of incense every day when we left that store. Everyone loved it, though. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And then strangers come up to me and say, what is that that you're wearing? It's like Blend 22. <laughs> <laughs> it's incense. I, I just around it that much. But yeah, we sold tons of patchouli. Awesome. Patchouli. Oh. We sold patchouli oils. What else? And Nag Champa. Oh, Nag no, oh, Champa. Everyone had Nag And we Chamba. always had that. We had that going in the store, too. But oh, we also had some kick-ass music on always always and even if it wasn't the dead or fish like mm-hmm. sometimes we'd throw on the talking heads one of the 
one of the top guys who worked for Don, a guy named John, he was a straight edge. And, you know, he'd John throw Cap. on the, yep, he'd throw on the Smiths hey, or, or mm -hmm. whatever it was. And, and we would jam Morrissey. to that. Absolutely. He was a huge Morrissey and the Cure fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always but that remember. was okay. I didn't want all heads working for us. I wanted it. The only group that we all agreed on that we all loved, and actually John came around. I'll, I'll tell you a funny little story. But we all loved Sinatra. Is that crazy? But I remember putting on Sinatra, and we'd all group to him. John came to me, and he said, years later, after he had left, he said, I, I knew that I – Definitely worked prime cuts when more people on the street recognized me and said, you're the prime cuts, dude. And they'd and they just come up to you. And it happened to me many times where they'd say, do you have this tape or do you have that tape in? Or like they were in your pockets. <laughs> and that you'd know it offhand. Are they are those tapes ready? We had well over 15,000 by the time it was done over 15,000 hours of uh, dead and fish. And I but, and, but the funny thing about John is he said to me. <clears throat> I knew that something was terribly wrong with my life when I was able to answer all their questions. Oh. <laughs> and he knew all the dead shows and all the fish shows by heart. And uh, it was, he said it with a smile. I would say up until Coventry, mm -hmm. I would be walking around random shows. I'd be as far out as like uh, Deer Creek or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'd be walking through lunch. So I would be like, hey, there's a chick from Prime Guts. <laughs> I'd be like... <laughs> How, what? How do you know me? But one thing that I left out about my responsibilities at the store is that apparently I have like this little GPS system in my head and people would call from all over the tri-state area. How do we get here? And the people would automatically hand me the phone yes. and I would know what bridge you would need to go to, what exit, which back way are you coming from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south? Okay, we're, we're talking Pennsylvania. We're talking Maryland sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And people would drive up and they'd be like, how do we get there? I'm like, well, you got to go. <laughs> you know, and here I am sneaking onto the Long Island Railroad from a 10 minute train ride away. <laughs> you can imagine <laughs> coming problem. from Maryland. Uh, exactly. The last, the last thing I wanted to ask for until the next segment is, Toward the end of Prime Cuts's, uh, if that's the way to say it, of the career of Prime Cuts, you moved to right. North Belmore. What facilitated or what caused that? Two things. One, my seven-year lease at the second Rockville Center store was up, and I went to the landlord to renegotiate a new lease, and he wanted to add 50% to the cost of rent. He saw your, that I was successful, and he said, all right, I want to cut it at and it would have priced me out of range of anything I could have kept the business going with. And I pleaded and begged with him. No, nope, it wasn't happening. So there was a point there where we actually, we, I closed up that store and there was no prime cuts for a good six or seven months, maybe even more than that. I had the store in my basement, which was not very easy. I'll tell I you. And then imagine. we finally... I finally found the West Belmore store, but honestly, it was never the same. At Rockville Center, the two stores there were the heyday. And the other thing was the internet was really emerging as a force. Uh, the big stores were all closing up one by one. And now th this predates it a little bit, but once burners came, started coming on every computer, kids were able, first of all, to switch to digital instead of the, the days of the cassette were, were numbered and over. And when new albums came out, uh, one kid would buy the album where it used to be 40 or 50 kids would come in. Even like, you know, like I said, we sold other music besides um, jam band stuff. But, you know, if the new Van Halen came out, we'd sell 50 of them the first day. Well, it became three. And those kids would record for every kid that they knew. And you just couldn't compete against that. And um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention one of the most fun things about the store. We did not carry paraphernalia on a regular basis because it was a family store. That's how I treated it. I wanted a 10 year old kid to come in and feel just as comfortable and for their parents to feel comfortable with them. But we did have a, a ton of glass back when glass was impossible to find um, unless you were at a festival and it was quite illegal. I remember going to festivals and having police come in and bust up people's booths because they sold glass. Isn't that amazing? But we would break out the glass. We'd pass out invites to our, a glass party. 
we'd bring in these bands to play. Marty and Tiberius played a whole bunch of times. I guess they were- But what times house- did these parties start? I'm thinking we closed the store around seven or eight and the parties would start around 10 or 11. And Usually about we 11. Rock. We'd move all the fixtures in the store off to the side of the store. And I'm glad there was no supervisor from Rockville Center who ever came down because we put <laughs> 250, 300 people into wow. prime cuts. And this is the bigger prime cuts it was 2000 square feet, but it was packed wall to wall and the band would play and then they'd, uh, introduce the glass sale and we break out rows and rows of wonderful pipage. Again, it was never meant to, and I never wanted it to take over the store and be the reason that people came down. But for these special sales, and we probably held about 10 of them all together. Every couple of months, we just say, we're throwing a glass party. And, uh, and there it was. The next segment, this is a surprise for anyone listening at home. This is a surprise for both Don and Kara. They don't know what's coming. But once you both agreed to be on this show and be interviewed to talk and reminisce about Prime Cuts, I put out a call on social media, on Facebook uh-oh. groups, and no, no uh-ohs, and on Twitter <laughs> with the message, something along the lines of anyone in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, tri-state area, if anyone has memories, kind words, or thoughts about prime cuts, message me, let me hear them. And you can't see it at home if you're listening, but I got pages and I'd like to read a couple of them to you. All you done. So, well, (laughs) anyone who wants to comment. So one of them is from a guy who, this is on Twitter, whose name is posted as Ian Stone. And Ian Stone says, I have so many stories Worked there dubbing tapes before going on summer tour 99 with Fish. Don was a character, but a great hearted dude. There was a guy that worked there named Chris P. Doodle was his nickname, but his full name was Crispy Doodle. He ruled. (laughs) Before I left for tour, I went to Radio Shack and got myself a power inverter set up and four daisy chain cassette decks. Don from Prime Cuts gave me a huge, in capital letters, huge, box of Maxell XL2s that needed to be taped over. I used these and made first generation cassettes straight from dad tapes. And after each show, I passed them out. People couldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. So that's from Ian Stone. This I remember one, Ian well. Hmm? I remember Ian. That's wonderful. Thank you, Ian. And this is from a guy also on Twitter. I don't know his name, but his username is Black Taco. So he wrote... I- a short, a short <laughs> message. I would come back from Cornell with a ton of Mo tapes and hang out in the back with Howie, dubbing whatever I wanted in exchange. So many good times just mm. hanging out in there. Let's let's pour a shot for Howie. Yeah, we all loved him. Now, do you remember we had two Howies working, but Howie Kopman. Yeah, yeah, Howie Kopman. That's may awesome. rest in, in This peace. is from a person named Lieb, L-E-I-B, Lieb Medvin. He said, I started going to Prime Cuts in the late 80s. After Jerry got sick in 86, all of these deadhead stores started popping up around the country. So I would contact them about selling my jewelry. Don was very receptive, and I would travel there to visit him a few times a year from Philly. As the jewelry took off at his store, he commissioned me to build these wood and glass display cases for the store. I particularly remember in June of 1990, stopping off at Brendan Byrne on the way home to see Madonna and Technotronic. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Do you remember Lieb? I do. And I certainly remember the cabinets. Wow. You are reminding me and they are reminding me of things that I had locked away in a closet and just not thought of. And ever since you invited me on the show, Brian, I have started thinking about Prime Cuts, which is just this happy memory that I never wanted to tamper with. And I I put a bow on it and put it in the closet. And now it's coming out in Technicolor. And this is just (laughs) phenomenal. Yeah. Well, we have a couple more. So uh, someone else, Character Cero, (laughs) C-E-R-O. I started going there in 93. Helped me grow my collection to about 3,000 tapes, all of which I still have. Great shop and great vibes. It was like an extension of the lot, and it smelled fantastic inside. 
<laughs> I'm 22. There was that Nag Champa, right? Um, yeah. Here's uh, I don't the real Gwal, G W A L. I remember going there before a trip out to LA and wanted to grab a show for the fight. They knew I was a big Led Zeppelin fan and burned me the Moby Dick show from July 11th, 2000. Still one of my favorites to this day. I can get you pics of my old tapes and CDs if you want them. I, in my mind, I still have almost literally burned into my brain all these tapes. I wish I had a picture of my bedroom when I was growing up living at home of just hundreds, hundreds of case logic uh, tape cases, just all the purple and and light pink or dark pink just was done. Was that your handwriting? It is my handwriting. Oh, Always. <laughs> he wouldn't even let anyone do it. That's right. I was the only <laughs> one allowed to do the covers. <laughs> and I, I wanted people to be able to read them. Yeah. yeah, no, it was fabulous. I could even tell the little Thank notes you. that you wrote in there when there were asterisks in the set list. That was very and that was the thing. You mentioned so, so eloquently the binders, Brian. And with each show, if there was something really special about the show, whether it was the dead, whether it was fish, whether it was... Anyone else that was Dave Matthews back when he was a jam band before he went in a different direction, it would, we would write down what went on at those shows. And so people could get a good idea, or we'd say it's the first time this, this show was ever played yep. um, or things like that to give people a clue, or this is one of our uh, rated, one of our 10 greatest shows or greatest shows of the year. And so people had a place to start. And we'd also, I think we rated, we might have rated the shows also. So people knew what they were getting or and we would say audience or soundboard. I remember that we all always kept in stock Cornell 77 for the yeah. noob who came in and said, Hey, I heard about the Grateful Dead. Here, what, take this. What, what show would you like? <laughs> and it's just like randomly, like Cornell 77. Here you go. Good luck. Get back to me when you know what you're doing. <laughs> so that was always I think that might have been number one only mm. because it was always in stock and it was the go-to show I mean Arrow, I remember, and Arrowhead or, or the Roxy of Fish the same the go-to yeah, shows yeah 93 for the Roxy Arrowhead Ranch <laughs> July 91 I mean these are all coming back to me I remember grabbing uh, a Dave Matthews tape and I'll have to double check this I do a fact check at the end of every show mm. uh, January 26th maybe 1994 of Dave Matthews Ben playing in Burlington and Trey came on for Jimmy thing. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. might've even been Trey and Bela Fleck. I could be wrong on that detail, but I just remember. And it, anything that had soundboard SBD almost mm -hmm. always with an exclamation point. Also, I'm like, Oh, there's they were tough to come by. Point. Yeah. yeah, They I were know. tough to come by. But anything that had an exclamation point, I knew, all right, I'm getting this one. Even if I don't recognize the songs yet. <laughs> Um, this is an important part also, Kara, I see you got your finger up too, that I want to explain to anyone under 40, back when we were <laughs> dealing with cassettes, if you were lucky enough to get in the tapers section or to piggyback onto a tapers uh, unit, you had a first gen tape of the show and it sounded pretty damn good. But if you made a copy for your friend, the cassette to a cassette, it lost a lot. And when the, if you if they tried making a copy, fourth generation it, it was useless oh, awesome. and that was one thing i realized that if you come to my store you can always guarantee of getting being um of being able to find a first generation off of essentially my master because my my tape decks or my digital decks or everything that we ran was hooked up in the taper section at the wetlands uh, peter shapiro and i struck up a really nice friendship Pete would tell me anytime you want to come down, Don, just plug into our soundboard. And I got had some amazing, amazing shows that took place over the years. Uh, the whole closing of uh, um, the 10 year anniversary, Red Bag of Pardon of the Wetlands, we had the whole series. Bob Weir came in and, uh, and played with Rob Wasserman, just amazing stuff, wow. and amongst others. All right. So we're going a little off track the other way, but it, it okay. just gives credence to what Prime Cuts was. On August 9th, 1995, mm -hmm. Jerry Garcia died. Mm -hmm. I was a camp counselor and someone who was a little sarcastic and not into the scene came over to me and was like, hey, aren't you a deadhead? I'm like, yeah. 
He was like, well, Jerry Garcia just died. I ran to a pay phone because we're in 1995. I called the store. Don's like, yeah, it's true. With that, I went to, I left my job. I went to the store and the store was packed and we were yeah. selling everything left, right, and sideways. But the point is Newsday, the Long Island newspaper that probably a million people read came straight to Don Cantor. He was the voice of Long Island when we lost Jerry. And I have more posts here that speak to that. Uh, these next two are from the same person who I just read, uh, Gwal, or the real Gwal, G-W-A-L. Uh, he said, uh, the owner, in parentheses, Don, was a great dude. I also remember when they upgraded from tapes to a CD burner. I love this place. For fans like me who didn't have tape connections, it was the only place to get them. I got my first show tapes there, which would be, he put in parentheses, October 21st and 22nd, 1996 at Madison Square Garden. And I went to the Billy Breathe's midnight release party. Such good memories. Then they moved right by me in Belmore before they closed. Mm. Buckeye fan, 14. Um, I'll DM you. I got a few stories about that place. It was always an event when we went there. Usually it would be four of us in the car. There was a strategy involved. It was an adventure, even if it was only 30 miles away from Westchester. Uh, this next guy, Uncle Traveling Matt. Walking in with a pack of XL, Maxell XL2S 90s and walking out with a handful of fish, Mo and Dead, was a, was a true highlight of my week. That place smelled great, sounded better. <laughs> and the way That's people's... And the way there's a the visceral, a visceral memory that people yeah. have. It smelled great. And the wake of the music <laughs> flood lasted a long time. And then he attached a photo of his tapes and his Walkman. Uh, the last one I have uh, from a guy, Gata Debru. I would bring tapes there from a taper college buddy, Generation One Maxell XS to 100 minutes. Also went there on August 9th, 1995, after I heard the news of Jerry Garcia's passing. I worked on lived on Long. I worked and lived on Long Island during these formative years. I mean, it's a legacy. I remember that the Jerry's death very well, and that was one of the. I can never call it a highlight, but it was one of those culminating moments uh, that will live forever. I remember, first of all, I had just come back from picking up another load of of Maxells. I stopped by my house, and my wife ran out the door crying sobbing hysterically and she she just yelled jerry's dead and i said oh my god she said <laughs> the first thing that she said was what's going to happen to to prime cuts and i said forget about that we need to get down to the store right now she said absolutely just forget about me i'll i'll come down later and see you and i went down to the store and people were laying flowers down at the store it was it was almost like a shrine they, i got interviewed they, by newsday Hundreds of people did not know what to do with themselves. And they all they all figured, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when John Lennon died and people didn't know what to do with themselves. When Jerry died, they came down to prime cuts and it was so gratifying. And I think we needed it just as much as they did because we, again, it wasn't just the store. We were all, well, almost all of us were huge fans too of, of the dead and of fish. And we were not part, I'll mention, we were not part of the dead versus fish thing. Another story for another day, but there was a whole movement with deadheads against fish heads. And it was crazy because I had no problem loving both bands. The dead was spiritual to me. The fish were, it was my release. Fish was fun. It was goofy. It was clever beyond anything I'd ever heard. And how could you not love them? It sounds like what you're describing is a community center essentially at its core. <laughs> it's really- always want, mm -hmm. always wanted to or put therapy. it in a couch. Yeah, <laughs> if you put it in a couch, that'd couch. be perfect. Um, I have two more to read. One is from a guy named John Coughlin who messaged me personally. He said, I could write a long essay about Prime Cuts, the CDs, the shirts, the incense, and of course the boots. <laughs> I still have a few tapes with the original J cards with the famous handwriting. I remember uh -huh. the days after they closed, sifting through old Calvin and Hobbes shirts in boxes in the alley behind the store. Behind the store, lots of memories there. Oh, gosh. And and I have one more. It's a bit lengthy. So if you're listening at home or if you're listening in your car to this uh, to this podcast, you know, uh, just take a breath and 
Get ready for this one. This is from a former guest on Attendance Bias. I name checked him earlier. His name is Slade Sommer. He is a successful journalist. He runs a website called The Recount. And he is the first guest I had on who, when I brought up, when I brought up Prime Cuts, his face just lit up like a Christmas tree. So here's what he wrote. The best non-bagel stuff on Long Island in the 90s, Billy Joel, Wally Zerbiak, and Prime Cuts Music Emporium. Before the legitimacy of live fish, before the streaming ease of fish.in and relisten, before even CDs and digital file trading, trading, there were hissy analog cassette tapes, and for that, there was prime cuts. The Rockville Center head shop looked and smelled like any other, if even a bit sparse. Tobacco use only water pipes and corduroy skirts and other assorted hippie merch with trippy symbology. But its tape policies set it apart from others. They sold pre-made shows on tape, doing the hard dubbing labor themselves. Prime Cuts was, in, in uh, capitals, was the center of the universe if you were looking to build a live fish collection. After all, the existing blanks and postage world of early online forums was an honest hassle. The routine was simple. Drive or train over, walk in the back, flip through the school issue binders, which shows were available for purchase that day, which was rotated. Pick up a handy golf pencil, scribble your show dates on an index card, hand it to the employee behind the register, named Kara, and <laughs> voila, exit with as many recent and or older life fish shows as you wanted, already dubbed for you, basically the cost of service and the tape itself, what a service. It was always my first stop when I came home from college. I grab a few shows off the latest tour, maybe some early 90s material, then trade with a buddy or two from their own trips to the store and trades. Then came the fun part, which doesn't exist so much in today's digital society. You'd listen to every nook and cranny of the show while making your own copy and filling out the J cards with the set list, complete with the asterisk show notes. It was a way to dive in deep to each recording and really pour over every note, every gimmick, every tray on keys in 1999. My 300 fish tapes are now set in a storage locker somewhere in Brooklyn wasting away for eternity. But 20 plus years ago, they felt like a lifeline, a world outside my real world. And Prime Cuts was the best and safest pusher there ever was. Rest in peace to the greatest of all time. Thank you. I have tears in my eyes. Yeah, that is it's something. It's everything I ever wanted to hear about Prime Cuts. And it was what I set forward to go about doing to create a store for the community, by the community. I don't want to get goofy about it, but it meant a lot to me to do the right thing for people and for the people of this community. And that comes across there. And I feel like I... You, know, you did good. I feel, I feel good. like I did good. That's right. So let's move on to a different uh, angle of things. Let's talk about our attendance bias for shows that we love. So for those of you listening at home, our guests today, Kara and Don, pick some big time favorites. And that is, you know, when you talk about attendance bias, I think it's very easy to see why we each have bias toward these uh, these shows and these jams. So Don, we'll start with you because your show is earlier uh, in mm -hmm. chronology and Kara will close with you because your okay. jams are more recent. So Don, okay. you picked set two of April 3rd, 1998 at the Nassau Coliseum, the island tour. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the whole is, staff went. The whole, the staff, whole went. staff went. I took the yep. entire staff out there. That's right. That's the best work retreat that I could ever imagine <laughs> in <laughs> my was, life. Well, you know the story because you were you were an American there. It was literally five miles up the road, up Long Beach Road, right to the Nassau Coliseum. Um. You go ahead. You tell me, ask the questions and I'll, I'll ruin <laughs> well, my answers. <laughs> well, I, I don't have the way that I usually do these uh, show breakdowns. I don't necessarily have set answers. I just kind of muse on the shows. Mm. And then I'd love to hear your feedback uh, because you're the one who picked it. A I few did. things. I remember where I was. I was a sophomore in high school. I remember I could not go to the Island tour. Um, I was at oh. Belmore JFK. I know oh. I was at Belmore JFK. And I was in the drama club. And that year for the spring musical, they put on Tommy, which is my favorite music in the whole wide world. The Who are my favorite. And Tommy is my favorite mm -hmm. album. I was part of the cast. And I just can't drop out of that. I've been rehearsing for months. And when they announced the performance dates, it was April 2nd and 3rd. 
a Friday and a Saturday. Uh, so that was just not in the in the cards for me. I do remember my friend Craig, who I brought up earlier, my Prime Cuts buddy, he went. And when he, he liked the second, but I saw him on the fourth because the Rangers were playing the Islanders that Sunday, I remember. And we went to that game together. We weren't even paying attention to the hockey because he could not stop talking about what he witnessed on April 3rd for fish. He, you know, people talk about quote, getting it. He got it. And he was, he's like, I don't know what happened, but I loved it. He's like, I didn't know what song they were playing, but I couldn't it stop. Didn't matter. It didn't matter. <laughs> it started with that beautiful 30 minutes. Roses are free, which mm-hmm. is I think in contention for top jam ever that they've ever played moves on to a, an extremely intense, energetic Piper uh, loving cup during which a former guest of mine, uh, Jojo Cassoni, Tigger, jumped on stage to raucous applause from the audience. And then they closed with the goofiest run like an antelope where they kept saying, Karini's going to get you. Yeah, I think enough people listening know a lot about this show. Don't that let Karini get you. Yeah, don't, right. don't let Karini get you. But I think that I don't need to break down the different parts of it. I'd rather just hear your impressions of the show because this is a pretty high profile one. I would say that for years, by the way. It's like, and don't touch the drummer. <laughs> right, right. What, what, what Fishman kept saying. It was um, amazing. But um, yeah, you mentioned it, it was a short set. Um, forgetting about the uh, the encore, but Roses Are Free with the jam that came after it just was, it threw it into a whole different universe. The jamming was what did it. Now, I was always someone who liked more accessible songs as much as, I loved seeing Fish for the extended jam outs. I loved the t- a tight melody and some really good lyrics, which is what drew me to Fish in the first place. Uh, early songs like Cavern or Llama, uh, Go the Apparatus, not so much for the lyrics, but just for the, the <laughs> fun and craziness of it. But they, when they open Roses are Free, it is just, well, first of all, I knew it from Ween uh, playing the song. It was magical. Uh, they they sung it great. They had they tied a nice little bow on it but then they went out into this extended jam and it just brought you out into space By the time they got into Piper, they brought it back for a tight Piper. And then I remember Piper went out to 15 minutes into a Piper jam. Again, it was like, oh, oh, they had me. They had me totally hooked.
um, by the time they, they got to the first couple notes of Loving Cup, it was like, oh, uh, I, I don't know if I could curse on your show. So I'll just say, say whatever you want. Oh, fuck. They're going into <laughs> Loving Cup. And, and I was just screaming through, <laughs> through Loving Cup. It was just, it was phenomenal. And, and then, of course, you, you mentioned JoJo got up on stage. Funniest thing, just a little side note. We had been out in the parking lot. All of us went in separate directions. We were just checking out the scene. And we had a good laugh because we saw Jojo running around with his Tigger backpack with a huge smile on his face. Just he was all oh, blissed out. And he was just going up to people and saying hi and then going, you know, skipping around. He was bouncing around the lot. <laughs> and yeah. and then, the, when the show is on, we're, and we're just going, wow, this is amazing. And there's Jojo on stage. And I didn't know it was Jojo at the time until, honestly, until uh, just a few weeks ago, your your interview. But uh, we were hysterical about it. And then Fish, because they interacted with the audience, instead of just saying, hey, you know, get the hell off the stage or that, they made a joke of it. And it was perfect. It was four songs that stretched out in, what, an hour and 20 minutes, I suppose? Yeah, an hour there. plus, yeah. And it was magical. You didn't need, and especially for a guy like me who liked having 10 songs that were tight and, and orderly, this took me all over the place. Um, the balance in a two for Loving Cup brought me down to earth after the first two great jams. And then it went right back up again uh, for Antelope and, and Trey rocked out so hard on it too. And it, it left us breathless. Is why it's that that's the musical reason why it's my favorite show yeah, what about what about sentimentality what about it meant so much to you what meant so hanging much out with me oh, yeah. <laughs> um bringing my whole my whole group down to it so we made it even the kids who were not into it at all or who worked for me they had a good time too we all did and it was i don't think it's my imagination at all Kara. that i think we had a very tight group that it made it fun to come into work. And everyone, I, I wanted to be a boss who had to do certain things to steer us in one way or another, but I didn't want to take the joy out of working. And, and this was one of the rewards. I remember I took the group to the Pink Floyd at uh, Nassau Coliseum at a later point. We, we, we would do stuff together like this. And we traveled as a group on the 2nd of April. We taped the show. And we ran back down the three, four miles down to Prime Cuts from Nassau Coliseum. And Howie Kotman and myself, and I think we had a couple others, Matt might have been amongst them, Matt Bush. Uh, and by the way, shout outs to Graham, shout outs to Joy, shout outs to Carol and everybody else who worked for Prime Cuts. I miss you guys so much. We pulled an all nighter and we just, we, I had picked up a couple thousand tapes, a couple thousand tapes, and we just started taping. I had a setup where we recorded 16 tapes simultaneously, front side and back side, 
and we had it all EQ'd up for these Maxell tapes. And I said, we're going down to Nassau tomorrow. We're going to have these tapes ready and we're giving them out. This is our payback to, you know, paying it forward to the crowd. And I didn't want to put my name on it. I didn't want to be advertising, but we had that little sun emblem that we used. It was just mm-hmm. a little stock logo, but it was a little um, sun wearing shades. And we had it on a sticker. I had made stickers of that um, a stamp actually. And we put a stamp on every, every one of those tapes. And we just handed out somewhere between 500 and a thousand of them. And people just had them. And a whole lot of people knew where they came from because of that stamp, but um, no charges. Uh, it was, it was my way of giving back to the community. And that set up my show too. Cause I was, you know, I hate to say it, the, the most selfish thing you could do is give things away because you feel so good about yourself. After <laughs> I, I felt like a million bucks and it was a really nice feeling. You did and fun. then we went in and, and we got payback from the band by giving us a monumental second set. And the first set was not shabby either. So I just want to throw one thing in that is tribute to Prime Cuts. There was never a better time in my life than when I was in college. My sophomore, summer between freshman and sophomore year is when Don hired me. And all of a sudden I started coming home every other weekend to work. <laughs> That's how much I loved it. I would, I'd rather come home to Long Island in my parents' house and be in prime cuts than in snowy Boston at a bunch of fraternity guys' parties <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Wouldn't we so all? your family wasn't enough to get you home. My story was. <laughs> exactly. One time I made it home from Boston in two and a half hours because I was a maniac. Holy and I had to terrible. go hide in the store so that my parents weren't like, how fast did you go? <laughs> you had to make them think you took your time. Exactly. Yeah. I made up an hour. <laughs> I had one last uh, grace mm-hmm. note on that story, Don. Then Kara will talk about the, the jams that you picked. Um, okay. One of the one of the messages that I got, someone brought that up that uh, in Providence on the fifth of that wow. year of uh, April fifth, that someone was in a Burger King parking lot and someone just handed him a tape and it's me. He, it was you and it, he he couldn't believe it that it was forty eight hours from the show and someone was just handing him a tape. He was at a rest stop on the way home. We walked in and of course every like coming back from Boston, it was a caravan of fish heads. And we just happened to stop in the same, on, we were online with a whole bunch of other fish heads. And I had a bunch of tapes in the car, I ran back and got them. And I said, who wants a tape of um, of the the uh, the show from the second? Actually, I had the shows from the third that night also, because yeah. after the third, we made those up and I had I had a day. Yeah, I found I it. I remember it. It was the, the username on Twitter is Nettie Kilowatt, last tube. The strangest story I have about Prime Cuts is obtaining a copy of April 3rd, 98 in a Burger King parking lot after April 5th, 98. For some reason, some dude from Prime Cuts was selling the tapes in the Burger King parking lot. Weird, I know. Wait, wait, selling them? That's, no, that's his words, his words. Okay, never. I handed them out. <laughs> now, if I did business in my store. I did gifts when i was outside so karen wow. you picked uh, a show but specifically two jams that are pretty monumental uh you picked from fish's comeback uh 3.0 first show the back comeback the show. comeback yeah the comeback <sighs> show uh march 6th 2009 specifically you picked the clear favorite right the fluffhead show opener and then you enjoy myself which was the second set closer i was listening to it again last night and there's a, they did, they did a, vol, a jam and then I, I missed a song in between that and Love and Cup. Like somehow the jam was so out there that I missed, I don't remember what it was. And then all of a sudden it was Love and Cup, which is my favorite encore song ever of all time. Well, You Enjoy Myself closed the second set and then Love and Cup was the encore. So I think it was You Enjoy Myself. That was settled on because we were going back and forth. I think I was enjoying myself. (laughs) Yeah, uh, yeah, clearly. (laughs) My side of that show is my girlfriend at the time. We were obviously looking for tickets. We got tickets for the Sunday night show, but we could not get tickets for a Friday or Saturday. So instead, we drove down after work on Friday and we got to Virginia probably around 
10 30 at night it was a long drive and i also remember this is the first time that fish was broadcasting not broadcasting but they were posting the set list in real time and i made her drive the last leg so i could look on my phone and see what what they were playing and when i saw that they opened with fluffhead i screamed i screamed right out the window i re- i could remember it clear as day my thoughts at the time were that they were kind of making a statement that they hadn't played Fluffhead at all in 2.0. It's one of their most complex songs. It's one of their earliest songs, and it's a fan favorite. So my interpretation of that is we're here for real this time. We're here to try. We're here to keep it going. And this is a representation of what we want to give to you. And we're excited to be here. And anytime you listen back to that recording, that uh, that audience response Good Lord. So I've said my piece. Let's hear from you. All right. Well, like you said, the eruption from hearing Fluffhead. And then the first um, verse of the song, we all sang along to. We were all there. I want to note on the crowd, it was yet to be filled with uh, the younger crowd, definitely people my age, maybe 10 years younger, but uh, it was a nice crowd and uh, they busted out Fluffhead and everyone went nuts and we all sang along to that first verse. And then as they're jamming, if you listen closely, and I actually went back and saw that my recording is not a soundboard. There's silence through the entire jam because we were hanging on every single note. I mean, when they brought it back down and back together, of course, we were always singing and celebrating. And it it was just magical. It, it was almost like a music class, like or or like sitting at the opera. I have never seen the the, the crowd so just mesmerized, just absolute, absolutely mesmerized from what I saw. But I also have to say that I am a huge fan of CK5. Of and course. he he could do no wrong in my mind. And he definitely, I, I it baffles me how he knows exactly when to nail it every time. So that was fluff. fluff was that must just, have felt incredible. You, yeah, you got and and I, I can't describe it without you hearing the silence, I can't explain silence. So if you listen to it, you will really, it sounds like a soundboard because there's no one talking.
that opened the whole show and the era that we're currently in, although there is this 3.0, 4.0, blah, blah, blah. But let's fast forward to the end of the show, not the whole show, but the second set when they played You Enjoy Myself. I they did. love this, but I'm not going to say anything. This is all on you. Why did you pick okay. You Enjoy Myself? I picked it because it caught my attention. I'm listening to it. Oh, why? Yeah, what a nice way to close an epic show with an amazing set list and a first night back. And they're playing and all of a sudden Trey goes, wait, stop. <laughs> We're starting over. never seen that before so I was like okay and now I'm holding on to every single note and they play the you know the instrumental and a very spacey jam where Paige had a beautiful little few moments of his own and then they're building on building on each other you could hear Trey and then Fishman took it one step higher and one step higher and they just kept going and then all of a sudden when it was time for God shit man no, I said that backward. Boy. Yeah, so did Trey. He said it wrong too. <laughs> and that's why he went, went, no, no, no. God shit. God shit. Yeah. <laughs> The song's just so incredible and it went on for like it was like at least a 20 minute jam the trampolines came out they were on top point with that trampolines and they have definitely by then hit 50 then it ended with this really awesome well it ended with everyone back in the groove and singing and going on and whatever and then there was this really halloweenish kind of vocal it was a vocal jam but it took on like a Halloween feel. Like it almost got spooky towards the end. And I know that that's Fishman and, and the way he likes to play. You know, he, he tries to be the clownster. So, uh, but it was definitely a very, a very interesting transition into what was then Loving Cup, which, you know, they can do no wrong with. I was listening to this, You Enjoy Myself, for the last two or three days, like since you selected it, um, just because I wanted to be in the vibe with you as you described it. And I had this random thought, how, like, I remember the anticipation because I was there for the weekend, even though I wasn't at the first two shows, I hung around Hampton. I was with the crowd. I was with my friends. It was a big family reunion, basically. And I remember thinking, how silly is it in the big worldwide view, how happy people are to hear these four guys say, what you feel, see, drive me to forensic. Like, how therapeutic <laughs> it is to hear this garbled nonsense. <laughs> and, you know, like, this is what we And no one will for. get it. <laughs> right. No one will get it. And, mm-hmm. you know, I I don't know if I said this already. I thank them at the end of every show. I often cry at the end of every show. 
I don't think that unless you, you just, you don't get it. I, I, you know, I'm, um, I'm my father's caretaker and I'll be like, dad, I'm going to go upstairs and stream a fish show. You're 50 years old. Don't you think it's time to, I'm like, well, you know, this is, this is my way to win. You enjoy my, this is my way to enjoy myself. Like I'm taking a night off. I'll be in my bedroom, couch torn fish. And you know, (laughs) dad, 50 is the new 30. That's right. (laughs) I wish. (laughs) Well, I can't thank you both enough for making this happen. This interview or just conversation, I think is a better word for it. Mm -hmm. Went better. was more heartfelt than I ever could have imagined. I like, selfishly that I got to say my piece about how much prime cuts meant to me. And depending on what thought I'm having at the moment still means to me, you know, it's, it's alive. It's still a part of me and always will be. So selfishly, I'm glad that I got to express that to the two of you. Yeah. We, I could talk and Kara could also so much about our store and about how much heart and everything went into it. And I thank you for everyone who's out there who hears this. I am and have lived with my wife and family up in near Ithaca, New York, right near Cornell for the last 20 years. We love it up here, but I miss people say, do you miss Long Island? I say, I, I miss Long Island from the 1980s, the 1990s. I don't know if I'd miss it now, but I miss you guys. And I miss my store every day. Still. People ask me how Noah is. They remember Noah from the store. And his my little son, my son used to go around in a bouncy when he was, I was like couldn't, three years old. He, he, he would bounce around the store. <laughs> All right, let's wrap this well, up. All right, well, <laughs> yeah, final words. I just want to say thank you both again. It's been more than a pleasure. It's been a passion of mine for years. I can check more guests off my dream list for this podcast. So thank you so much for being so flexible and for joining me today on Attendance Bias. Thank awesome. you so Have much, Have a Brian. great night. Thank you, you too. That was great. Soon after we stopped recording, it dawned on me, Don, and Kara, that early on in the episode, it stopped being an interview and it became more of a conversation. Later, I found out that Don and Kara hadn't seen each other for many years prior to this conversation, so I kind of turned from something of a host to more of a fly on the wall for this reunion of old friends. And like any catching up conversation, there were a few conversation points that needed to be looked up. And that leads us into today's attendance bias fact check. Attendance bias fact check. Kara's first show on May 8th, 1993 at the UNH Fieldhouse is an all time great show featuring 1993 fish at their absolute best. There are tons of teases and callbacks throughout the show, including the short jam on the Allman Brothers Jessica during the David Bowie intro as Kara confirmed. A little bit later, the reason that Don and I were so tickled to talk about his first show, December 28th, 1990, at the Marquee in New York City, is because this episode was recorded on Wednesday, September 15th, 2021. On that same day, the attendance bias interview with Sue Drew, who signed Fish to Elektra Records way back in 1991, was released, and she picked that same show to talk about on the podcast. So scroll back a little bit into prior episodes and you could hear more about December 28th, 1990. When Don mentioned his most recent shows, he got a little tripped up about Fish's two festivals at Watkins Glen. To be sure, the fact check on that is that Fish's first festival there was in 2011 for Super Bowl, and their second festival was in 2015 for Magna Ball. And let's not even get into 2018. As a reminder, Don was a vendor at those festivals, and the name of his vending business is Indigo Moon. When talking about Fish's two-night show in Brooklyn in 2004, we mentioned Keystone Park. The name of the minor league baseball stadium in Coney Island is, at at least was at the time, Keyspan Park. When talking about post-chill munchies, I suggested getting off the train to get some All-American. For anyone not on Long Island... All American Burger is a small, privately owned burger joint in the town of Massapequa. The most charming parts of it is that, first of all, it's still designed as if it's 1955 and looks like it'd be right out of Back to the Future. The prices are still extremely affordable. That chocolate malt and fries that Don described would probably run him about $4 at the most. It's delicious, it's an institution in the area, 
and it even made a cameo in Oliver Stone's Born on the Fourth of July. If you're ever in the area, I highly recommend stopping by All American Burger. When describing the lot scene and what led him to opening Prime Cuts in the first place, Don makes reference to, quote, the last Grateful Dead show ever with Jerry Garcia in Washington, D.C. I'm not sure if Don was talking about a different show or maybe he just wasn't sure about the venue, but the last Grateful Dead show with Jerry Garcia was on July 9, 1995 at Soldier Field in Chicago. To Don's point, however, the band did play RFK Stadium in the summer of 1995 on June 25th. When talking about the taping process for Prime Cuts, Kara and Don bring up the fact that they donated a percentage to the Wagon Wheel Foundation. When I followed up with Don, he said that he meant the Water Wheel Foundation, with which we're all familiar. In Lieb Medvin's message about Prime Cuts, he mentioned building a custom wood and glass case for the store, and then he stopped at the Meadowlands to see Technotronic open for Madonna in 1990. After some searching, I found out that the show, The Madonna Show, was played on June 20th, 1990, and it features an unbelievable set list if you're a Madonna fan. Couldn't find anything about Technotronic. I tried my best to recall a date when Trey came on to play with Dave Matthews Band in Burlington that I first heard from a tape I got of Prime Cuts. I almost got the date right. It was on January 26th, but it was 1995, not 1994, like I originally thought. However, I was wrong about Bella Fleck coming on to play at that show. That was another tape entirely. Anyway, the Dave Matthews Band with Trey and Burlington is an outstanding recording if you've never heard it. It's available on YouTube on a soundboard quality recording. About the island tour, I mentioned that I couldn't go, but my friend Craig did. I remember that the day after the April 3rd show, Craig and I went to a Rangers-Islanders game together at the Coliseum. I don't remember much about the game since Craig was raving about the fish show, but it turns out that the Islanders shut out the Rangers 3-0 and even Ziggy Poffy scored a goal for the Isles. For the record, set two of April 3rd, 1998 lasted for an hour and five minutes, according to fish.in. And that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank Don and Kara for joining me today, fish.net for their help with the fact check, fish.in for the recordings used in today's episode, and an extra special thanks for everyone who reached out to me on social media to share their memories and stories about Prime Cuts. It's obvious that even though the store is gone, the love of it is alive and well in its customers' hearts and minds. And if you enjoy Attendance Bias, please support the show by leaving a rating and a review on your favorite podcast app. For this podcast, where I don't ask for any money, I don't ask for donations, no Patreon, nothing like that, a rating and a review is the best possible way for you to support it. So thank you for doing that. Also, you can reach out to me on social media, specifically on Instagram and Twitter, and I'll send you a free sticker if you say hello. Thank you again for listening to Attendance Bias, and I'll see you next week.